Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please make your way back to your seats so we can start the next round of presentations on time. Thank you. Uh, we have seen a lot of exceptional photography today, but we are the Center for Railroad Photography and Art, and our last presenter of the day is going to show us some art. Gil Bennett began painting professionally in 1984 and is proficient in both oil and watercolor. He is a commissioned artist who has worked for large corporations on advertisements, as well as individual buyers looking to revive nostalgic memories. Gil paints landscapes, portraits, and Western themes, but he prefers to paint his favorite subject, trains. Gil actually came out to our in-person conference in Lake Forest last year, and, uh, was, and we're just delighted that he was able to join us again on short notice uh, with an all new presentation that he's calling Railroading with a Brush. Uh, he's coming to us from his home in Utah, and he's going to take us on a journey through railroad history with this presentation. Welcome, Gil, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, and I appreciate being here today, and welcome to Railroading with a Brush. I'm your host, Gil Bennett. This is the COVID-19 edition. COVID is the virus. 19 is how many pounds one gains because they're sitting around home all the time. This is me. I work alone. I'm a company of one, which has its advantages. I'm employee of the year. I've made this seven out of the last 10 years. However, the company picnics are a little lonely and lackluster. In 19, 2019 conversations, I was working on the 2020 calendar for Miner. Miner usually contacts me around March or April, but this year they contacted me in the late part of August. They only had a couple of weeks for me to do a painting, and they wanted a picture of the 20th Century Limited someplace where it ran, and it had to be steam, and they wanted a streamlined. This was the inspiration for the painting. So I came up with a sketch. This is a sketch. I took this off my iPhone, hence the lens distortion. But I had Chicago, downtown, LaSalle Street Station with four sections of the century, one behind the other one that's uh, in the foreground. This was the sketch, and this is how the painting turned out. If you look closely on the far left, the Commodore Vanderbilt is ready to take off after, five minutes after the, the sections of the centuries leave. This painting took two weeks to do, it took me two days to do the locomotive, three days to do the track, one day to do the building, and six days to put in all the windows. Turned out quite well, I think. I was asked in the Conversations 2019 gathering how my paintings are created. So this is the process. The first thing I do is study. So this is me hard at work studying for a painting. Next, I come up with a sketch. I have a drawer full of sketches, that, which is, has a five inch pile of paper, which are sketches that I've done for paintings. Some have made the paintings, others have not. However, during the process, one of the, uh, in my watercolor medium, I used an art board, a watercolor board, and they keep making these and then they stop. Uh, Howard Fogg taught me or told me what he used, he showed me the, the watercolor board in about 2001. That company went out of business, it was from France. Uh, other companies have put out a watercolor board. Arches was the last one I used, and as you see, it says, sorry, we're not making the art boards anymore, so good luck with whatever. So I had to stop painting trains and had to do some other things. When I paint other things, it gives me a chance to beat up watercolor paper and just to test it to its limits to see how it works. So here's a ship. This is the USS Epperson. Uh, this was built in 1949. I did this for a, uh, a guy that called me up and said, hey, would you do me a ship? So this is a test paper and also a ship. Paper is actually pretty good on this one. This is the view up my backyard. Um, this is Mount Timpanogos. This paper turned out to be okay too. I was able to really mess with the sky on this one, which is pretty nice. This paper I hated, even though the uh, painting turned out okay in the end. I would never use this paper again. And this is the paper I ended up using. This is a 300 pound arches. And it's a rough. So once the sketch is done, then the painting starts. 
So this is how the sketch turns out when I, when the client looks at it and says, yeah, this is kind of what I want. And this is how the painting turns out. The sketches are mainly for composition and placement on the paper and making sure I can get everything in the set size. I was called earlier this year to, or late last year to do uh, something for the White Pass and Yukon. Their locomotives are wearing out. And <clears throat> since they have so many trains running on that line, they wanted a new locomotive. So they asked me to design some locomotives for them. And the perimeters were, I had to have, had to have uh, eight, ac eight axles on the locomotive. And they were thinking of a BB truck or a D truck. So I did both. So these are my ideas for the White Pass and Yukon locomotives. They had to have uh, like say 350 horses per axle. Would you make them around between 2,800 and 3,000 horsepower, which is what they wanted. So these are some of my ideas taken from uh, past locomotives that have been built. And they said, no, uh, we don't like your designs, but we would like you to design the new color scheme for the locomotives. I said, I'd be happy to do that. They said, it has to have the green and the red so it matches the train that they're pulling behind it. So I went ahead with green and red as the main, main colors. And then I added the yellow and uh, some other colors because that was the color they used on the White Pass and Yukon Depot at the present moment. So here are, the, here are the sketches of my ideas. I thought these were wonderful ideas. Uh, this was the locomotive they were going to use, which is a locomotive that are used in uh, their building in the Illinois area around Chicago. And they use these for narrow gauge railroads in Australia and uh, South America. Now all these ideas had, I didn't put the lettering on. This is just so they could see how the, the lettering would, or the color scheme would look on the locomotive. And uh, I got a call from them saying no, uh, they didn't like my ideas. However, um, we'd like you to do a, a painting of the locomotives before they're built just to see how they would look. And they came up with an idea based on the Norfolk and Western J, um, the 611. The uh, committee got together and said, okay, let's do a sketch. So this is the sketch that I came up with. And these are the seven brothers or the seven peaks or whatever they call them up there. When I rode the train, all this was rainy and uh, in cloud. So I had to use a, another person's shot. But this is what I came up with. Well, someone on the committee liked bridges. And since the White Pass and Yukon runs over many bridges, I came up with bridges. They also said, could you make it look like it's pulling a lot more cars because they're going to be uh, 13 car trains at this time. And, and I said, sure. So I put in the bridge and made it snake around. So there's a few more cars in there. Then the purist said, well, you know, this is really a famous place. So we have to keep it actually how it looks. So uh, we redid the sketch again. I darkened the sky a little bit. And uh, this was the final sketch, and they okayed this one said, sure, let's go for it. And this is how the painting turned out. So these are how the locomotives are going to look on the White Pass and Yukon. The first two have been delivered. They were in the original scheme, and the other eight that are being built right now will be in this scheme. Uh, I was able to name this scheme, and they're calling this the Black Mamba. So they didn't like my locomotive designs. They didn't like the way my color schemes were on the locomotive, but they did like the name. So they call it the Black Mamba. I'm pretty excited about that. And this is actually how the area looks up there. It's very pretty. Okay, at times it's easy to get what a client wants. I was called and asked to do a book cover for the logging railroads. They're doing uh, the logging mallets for uh, White River Productions. And the author called me and talked to me and said, could we do something, and we want this locomotive, which is the uh, 110, the Rainer 110, or the Warehouser, Wire, Wirehouser 110. And this was a sketch I came up with, and this is how the 
painting turned out, which is fairly close to the sketch. He also wanted it rainy and misty and ugly weather in the Northwest. And so we have this in the rain, which also kind of helps. Uh, sometimes it's hard to make it look like it's wet and rainy at times. Other times it's easy. And, and with rain, there's no light really. So the shadowing is just kind of a dull shadow on everything, which actually that makes it a little easier than other times. Okay, some, uh, <clears throat> some sketches when I'm working with a client will take a little longer. I was called by an ex-engineer off the Delaware Hudson who said he loved running the 700s along Lake Champlain and he wanted a painting of it. And I said, I'd be happy to. So he talked to his wife and they came up with an idea of the season. And uh, I suggested either winter or fall as I thought that would make a spectacular painting with the colors. And they decided to go with the winter scene. And this was the first sketch that I came up with. And he wanted a southbound train. So this is a southbound. You see in the lower right corner, Lake Champlain a little bit, some of it frozen over. And he said, yeah, can you put a bridge in there? So <clears throat> I added the bridge. And with the bridge added, I changed the scenery a little bit. And he liked the tree, but he wanted to see more of the lake. And he wanted a different bridge. So <clears throat> I uh, changed it one more time. I moved the bridge, changed the scenery a little bit, and I didn't like the bridge here because it leads your eye right off the page. So instead of looking at the locomotive, your eye is directed off the painting. So I said, hey, if we move the bridge back, I think it will work. So this is it. I moved the bridge back, and I have an eye stop on the left corner, and that's how the, the sketch turned out. Then I thought, well, you know, we could make a northbound, the same area, and so this is how it would look going north instead of south. And this way it would have been a little easier with the, with the shadows. But uh, he said, I like both the northbound and the southbound. But since we started with the southbound, I thought I would paint that. So this is the sketch and this is how the painting turned out. This is using the three different sketches, four different sketches that I used and uh, took out the best parts of each sketch. And he was very pleased with the painting. Miner calls me up. I love working for them. They challenge me. They give me an idea, or they have an idea, and I have to fill in what they want or what they perceive. So uh, they said, we want a painting with the station in Caliente, Nevada. And I thought, great, that's close. I've been there many times. The station's wonderful, and I know about all the UP power. It's in my backyard, etc. So off I started sketching. This is my first sketch. Now, when I do sketches for minor, they expect a name for it. Uh, other people would rather name their paintings or whatever, or they ask me to name them. I hate naming paintings, but I will name paintings once in a while. So I called this one Heavy Haulers. These are DD-35s. Uh, and of course, you can see the station in the background, which is what they wanted. Then I thought, well, hey, let's get, a, let's get an eastbound train going through there. So this is an eastbound. With a, with a TOFC train, and there's the station. I thought, oh, this is fantastic. This is gonna work out fine. Then I got a note from Miner saying, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't do diesel paintings on the calendars. So I thought, bummer. Uh, <clears throat> off to the steam. So this is the first steam one I came up with. But as I finished this, I thought, well, you know, it's kind of neat, but there's, you really can't see much of the station, which is what they wanted. So we put it on the other side, uh, change some of the locomotives. A Cali Anti Helper is what this one's called. And you can see the station in the background and the park that's next to the station. This is one of the sketches I came up with. This is another sketch I came up with, and this is a sketch they chose. Uh, the station is fairly prominent, and, and then I have the uh, mail train, mail train five, which is uh, westbound. Editor Los Angeles coming into Caliente. And they give me some ideas. They say, would you move this? They say, remove this track that's on the left, even though everything in front of the station to the left of what we'd see would be where the Caliente railroad yards were. They didn't want the track there uh, for some reason. Maybe it just led it off to the, to the distance too badly. And 
but I still wanted the three track scene. So this is how the sketch turned out. This is a half hour sketch. They wanted a 15 minute painting. So this is the, uh, I did this painting about 15 minutes just to see how the colors would look and how uh, the painting would be set up. And they said, okay, it, it looks fine. You know, like I say, this is a quick painting, kind of a throwaway thing. But this is how the original turned out. Notice there's still the, the three tracks are in there. I just kind of slid it over a little bit. And then I added some uh, outbuildings where the railroad yard should be in more track. And it turned out to fine. They were very pleased with it. And this is actually historically correct for the time period of the locomotive and how the station looked in about 1950. That's what I will say on this. And the area is, you know, spot on when they took pictures. Okay. So uh, I, they also gave me a, uh, a problem or a question saying, could you do uh, two trains running in the same direction on the same railroad? And after much thought, I came up with a list that no railroad, Western railroads would fit this at all. They had to be either in the Midwest or the East. I came up with the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, New York Central, or one of the anthracite coal roads. Or they used to have, at least had uh, three tracks or four. So these are the sketches I came up with. I call this one the hot shot and the local, the Lehigh Valley. Um, that's my first sketch. They didn't like it. The second sketch, different, using two different railroads, but uh, going out of Chicago, out of Inglewood, I have the race of the century. And this is the... Uh, Broadway Limited and the 20th Century Limited headed out of Chicago. And I thought, well, let's, uh, this is kind of fun to do. So let's make it a little more modern with the more modern steam. So we uh, changed it with a T1 and a Niagara. And I thought this would be kind of fun too to do. Race of the Century, a little bit more modern steam. Nope, uh, didn't want that one. Then I was thinking, hey, how about uh, the b and I was doing some research for another painting and came across the 17-mile grade, the cranberry grade. thought I could do this. So this is called Sand, Steam, and Soot with a uh, passenger train passing a coal drag. Eh. No, I liked it. I thought it would be a great painting. They weren't looking for that. Then I came up with the Indiana Harbor Belt. I call this one Tightening the Belt. We'll play on words. But they said, no, the locomotives look a little bit too much alike. Then I thought, well, in the West, uh, I was on a drive and the Galilee Loops on the Denver and Rio Grande Western in uh, Utah going up the grade have a triple track place where uh, they use the middle one for a passing track or a siding. So I have a passenger train passing a freight train Call this the summer of 42. Named after a movie, which I never saw all the way all the way through. This one, uh, New York Central, speed at Cold Springs, New York Central again. The engines are similar, same class. Passenger train passing a freight, and I thought we'll get the Penzi in there also. So I call this Mountains in the Middle, named after the TV show Malcolm in the Middle because this is the uh, mountains on the middle division. I thought it'd be a good painting. Apparently they didn't. As a throwaway, I came up with this one, Rain and Steam, and I had to figure out how this would work. And it turned out to be August 19, uh, August 29th, 1949. There was a hurricane that swept up the East Coast and shut down uh, traffic and destructed a lot of the areas. So they had to clean the track and hold trains. And so uh, this is the one they came up with. This is the sketch. And this is how the painting turned out, which is actually fairly close to the sketch. Again, another wet one, still raining. Uh, the track crew has cleaned up the track, got trees and branches off so the trains could move. And this is the fast flying Virginian and the George Washington, one passing the other. Oh, uh, well, I was going to do a uh, CNO 2666 for a guy, and he called me up and said, hey, 
put that painting aside. I, I want to do this. Can you do this? Only I don't like the hill. And I said, sure, I can take the hill out. So this is how the sketch is with the hill out. And I lowered it at an angle because I wanted to see a bit more of the tracks. This is how the painting turned out. He was very pleased with it. And again, it's almost the same thing. It's the same concept. But the hill is not there anymore. Some sketches start out well, and I did this for someone and said, I, yes, I'd like this, but I'd like you to change the railroad. This is a Lehigh Valley RS-11. But can you change it to a Boston and a main RS-3? So there's the sketch with different railroad and different locomotives. Turned out well. At times I come across things when I'm studying for other paintings that just beg to be painting. So I came across this about a decade ago and thought someday I'd really like to paint that. I didn't like the setting where it was. And uh, when it came for a Christmas card that I had to paint last year, I thought, well, I'll get this one out and use it. So this is, this is the photo. It's a BB photo. This is the, didn't have to do a sketch because I was doing it for me. And this is how it turned out. So this is on the Mohawk division. Again, using that photo, but changing the location. I don't own this, someone bought it. I like that one a lot. Okay, so here we go with the painting from start to finish. So here's the sketch. This is a preliminary sketch. It has the size. This is fairly rough. Uh, this one was called Smokin' in Shimokin. So this is Shimokin, Pennsylvania. And they had the ore trains coming out of Erie, and they drag them up to Shimokin and hand them over to the Lehigh Valley, and they would take them to down to Bethlehem to the steel mills. So this is the train coming up through Shimokin, and I had to do some research to get the. Uh, they have a bunch of collieries there for the for the hard coal. So this is actually coal country with an ore train going through coal country, which is kind of um, ironic. They're using the coal cars, but they're full of ore instead of coal. This is the sketch, and here we are. This is day one. Before lunch, I will map it out on the uh, paper just to make sure that everything will work and fit. I have my boundaries. I have things kind of set up how I want it to be. So this is day one before lunch, and I start painting day one after lunch. So this is uh, as much as I was able to get down between lunchtime and when I quit. Again, I was doing studying along the way so it would work, make sure everything was right. This is day two. It doesn't look like much is done, but it's actually quite a bit is done in there. Most everything off to the left is more or less finished down to the track level. Day three is fun. I get to put in the exhaust. I get to put in uh, some of the shadows playing on the building. The steam that you see that is white, that's just paper. The leftover whiteness of steam and, and some of the smoke is just pure paper. Day four, uh, started to work on the buildings, make sure they are in right. I had to do the setting to get all that correct and fooling around with some of the colors on the locomotive to start with. Day five, filling in the boiler of the uh, I-10 and working on the buildings a little bit more. And the paper started to bow a lot right here. So I had to figure out how to uh, straighten it up. So I stuck on a piece of masonite just to hold it in place so it would stay straight. This is day six. This is day seven. Still working on the locomotive, making sure I get it right. I had to make sure that the number and the details on the locomotive corresponded. That's one of the things I have to work through. This is day eight. Working on the second locomotive and also uh, the tender. Day nine, we have the second locomotive finished, the train coming off in the background. Day 10. Uh, the train complete, most everything complete, then start working on the track. Track always takes a long time to make it look good. Day 11 was a short day. I had to go to the dentist, so I 
fooled around at the track and then left it and then uh, came back the next day and touched up whatever I needed. So this is day 12. And the painting is more or less finished. I can't remember what I had to touch up, probably some numbers and a few other, few other small things that were uh, glaring for me that no one else could see. And this is the finished painting. The difference in the lighting is I shoot all my paintings outside once they're finished in, in the natural sunlight. And the paintings on that you saw before were just on my easel taken with my camera. It's kind of a daily uh, update for the person who is ordering and, or buying the painting. So this is the finished painting. Okay, some paintings work out well. This is the uh, idea, my idea of the painting. This is a race, uh, racing the storm to Evanston is what I call this one. Um, I decided to add a different, or uh, three locomotives behind the turbine instead of just one. This is the sketch. And this is how the finished painting turned out. So in the sketch, I had two locomotives behind the turbine in the original painting I put in three. Turned out quite well. That's new, okay. I get calls, can you do something at night? Night is fine, watercolor, it's a little more difficult to do night, but I get to uh, play with the lighting. I can move the moon to wherever I want it to be because I'm in charge. Uh, as Dick, in, or Dick Steinheimer said to me, you're lucky because you get to play with light. You can do anything you want with light. I have to wait for the right light. So this is a night painting sketch. Oops. There is the night. This is how the original turned out. Okay, here's the sketch of Milwaukee Road Little Joe's up in the Bitterroots. This is pretty close to how I wanted it to be. And this is how the finished painting turned out. Turned out quite well. Oops. Okay, some sketches, I know what I want to do. I just want to make sure everything will work. Uh, this is the, this would be the uh, Super Chief on uh, Glorieta Pass. This was the sketch, and this is the uh, how the finished painting worked out. Included in that is one of the uh, cars off the New York Central. This is a through car from New York to Los Angeles. I do sketch mock-ups. I was called by a client to do a picture of the Bannerman Castle with a train in the front on the New York Central Hudson line. So the more important, the important thing in this painting would be the Bannerman Castle. I would rather have it be the train. And so I said, well, these are my two ideas. And he said, I like the top one better. So I made a real sketch of that. This is how the real sketch turned out. Wanted to show speed. And uh, the locomotive right, racing down the track at 80 plus with the castle in the background. And this is how it turned out. So I have the engine speeding along very, very fast. And again, this one took quite a while because I had to put all the windows and get all the battlements and everything on the uh, castle correct. So this is about 19, it would be 1928. Eight, I think, that's how the castle looked at that time. And that's how the finished painting turned out, which turned out really well, I think. Uh, I was asked to do some uh, U50, U50Cs in Echo Canyon with one of the engines having problems. So I had to be smoking. So this is the sketch. This is a quick sketch, by the way. And this is how the finished painting turned out. So the second locomotive still has some uh, some problems going on. The exhaust on diesels actually show movement, so it turned out to be okay. I call, a guy from Canada called me and said, could you do a Selkirk without the snow plow in the summer? And I'd be, said I'd be happy to do it for him. This was my idea for the sketch. He okayed the sketch. And this is how the original turned out. Pretty close to the sketch, but not right on. But he was extremely pleased with it. I'm very pleased with it. It's one of my favorite paintings. Some paintings don't need a sketch. I was uh, asked to do a painting for a gallery up in 
Montana for a show recently, and uh, I was trying to find photographs of uh, the area that suited me, and I wanted to do Great Northern Steam, either an R1 or R2 or one of their 2880s, Clang Marias Pass. And I got a call from an artist friend of mine and said, well, yeah, why don't you do it with some of the sky blue SD45s? Uh, and I said, well, that's a neat idea. And so this is what I came up with. Uh, not everything is a sky blue. The sky blue carries enough pop to kind of be on its own, surrounded by the original. So this is the transition era between the two paint schemes. And I use an S. D45 and FP or F45 and then a Jeep 40, Jeep 35, maybe Jeep 40 in the background, one of the two. And this was, uh, I got a call while I was working on this. I had the lo lead locomotive done in the scenery and someone said, Hey, what are you working on right now? I said, well, I'm working on Mariah's pass. He said, can I see it? So I showed it to him and he said, I'll, I'll buy it. So this was bought before it was even finished. It still went to the show, uh, even though it was sold. And some paintings just happen. I'll be speaking to the Penn Central Historical Society later this year and thought, hey, I kind of need to do a painting for them. So this is what I came up with. Well, thank you for watching. I'd be more than happy to take any of the questions that you have. Feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, you can contact me at gill at gillbennett.com. That's my email address. And thank you for watching. I just, I got a pop-up question here. I said, what paper am I using now? I'm using an Arches 300-pound rough is what I'm using. I was using a 400-pound rough, but they're not making that anymore either. Gil, we got a question from uh, Angela at Trains Magazine who asks, uh, um, well, she, she just says she suspects that one of the hardest things to contend with as a commercial artist is being told by the client that they don't like it. How do you deal with that? Um, well, it, it, uh, well, I'm not getting, I wasn't getting paid for it, so I didn't really care. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot, of, well, I will tweak things until they do like it. Usually, uh, I, and I don't have an ego, so I don't really, if they like it, fine. If they don't, fine. Um, when I was in, in college, one of my professors said, would you rather have a, a, a prize uh, uh, from some show or sell your painting? And I was the only one that said, I'd rather have it sold than a prize. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there's times when um, people will say, yeah, it's, it's, it's not what I was looking for. Can you change it? So I will, I, I will change it until it's what they want. So that's what the mainly what the sketches are for. Well, that, that leads into another question from Brian Matsumoto, who wonders what's the largest number of sketches you have ever done for a final painting. Uh, the the minor one with the two train with the two trains going the same way that was the most. There was what six or eight or something that I found. That was actually very hard to find. Uh, everything has, that I do has to be historically correct another thing that's pretty tough to do. So I have to dig back into the history uh, to make sure that it's something that didn't happen. Um, they did ask me to do a painting of uh, Southern Pacific GS4 running across the Columbia River, and I had to write back and tell them, you know, that really never happened until <laughs> the uh, steam excursion days. And so I gave them another idea, and uh, they went with that, but they... I will, I'd not want to paint it again. Gil, there's been a couple of questions about who you consider your artistic influences. Uh, okay. Uh, number one would be Howard Fogg. Um, he was an industrial illustrator, which is what I call myself now, too, because I, I used to be a, an artist until... The IRS came out with, in 2009, they have a little thing that says, you're, if you're an artist, you can mark this box. And so I don't like marking the box as an artist. So I'm now 
an industrial illustrator, and until they have that on, I'll, I'll be an industrial illustrator. But Howard Fogg, uh, Ted Rose told me to uh, screw around with light and skies. Um, Steinheimer said, create the best light you can because you can do it, whereas photo photographers can't. Um, Rubens is another one. I never met him. And Titian, you know, some of the old um, artists from uh, the Renaissance era, just how they use some of their colors I liked. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. Uh, Gary Carter, some of the Western artists I like some of their, they have a little influence in me too, but it's all mix and match. Let's see, another question. Um, uh, Brooks Bentz asks, uh, Noting that it looks like most of the finished works here were watercolors, when do you choose oils and what is the key determining factor? Okay, actually half were oil, half were watercolor on these. Uh, when I paint watercolor, uh, I should have told you which was water and which was oil all the way through. But um, some people just like watercolor and some people like oil. It's, I, it's a personal preference for them and I will just paint in either medium, depending on what they want. So I, I will suggest a couple of things um, that mainly will fit, I think, better. I would rather do buildings in watercolor than in oil, even though I've not really done that. All the cities I've done have been in oil, which is a pain in the rear end. Uh, the Chicago painting, there were Two thousand some odd windows in it. So monotonous painting windows and window. I'd come down after breakfast and paint windows until lunch. Then I, I, that was it. I had to go to the gym or something. Then I come back and paint another thousand windows. It was just miserable. But without windows there, that painting doesn't work. It's a right. city. There was another question I summoned popped up that. Oh, the first painting I, I, I ever did? I got a question. Um, yeah. I can't even remember because I was drawing about at the age of four. I do have some of my, shall I say, primitive works. And gas turbines were, uh, I would see all the time. So I, I did gas turbines. 19, I, I remember in 1998, I discovered the Union Pacific Challenger first time in a book. I mean, they look so similar to big boys. I, I never, you know, at that age, I didn't understand it. And in 1970, I was actually climbing around on 9, and 3985 when it was in the yard with 4,023. Uh, uh, engineer took us out there after I'd wash a train coming. So um, I love steam. I'd rather do steam than diesel, but it's, it's a lot of fun doing some of the big diesel things. And I like everything. How many days? Wait, I missed that last question. What was the last question? It said how many days, and then it faded. Oh, I, I missed that one, Gil, but uh, someone was asking your preference for oil versus watercolor, and I recall fondly your answer from Lake Forest last year when I think you said it was whatever you're not working on right now. That is true. That is true. <laughs> Uh, at the present moment, I'm working on a watercolor, and it seems to be going really, really well. So I'm liking the watercolor, but I just finished an oil, which was, I mean, I was excited to get up and go down and paint on that one. So that was a lot of fun to do. So uh, uh, I think the mix and match keeps me excited about which medium I, do, I use. Someone else asks what, uh, well, a couple of questions about size. How long? How large is a typical painting, and what's the largest canvas you've ever painted? Okay, uh, typically the canvas sizes I paint with, uh, 18 by 24 is the mean. Um, I also do 22 by 28 a lot. I just finished finished one of those. Um, uh, all the minor calendars are an odd size. The minor paintings, and they're 22 by 30. So I either have to scrounge around and find someone to build me a canvas or I have to build one myself on that size. The largest one I've done is uh, four feet 
by no, five feet. Five, wow. four feet by 13 feet. That was the largest one I've done. That was for a boardroom in Colorado. Uh, we had to ship that over on a glass truck. It was strange. It was on a panel glass truck. Okay, so I saw one about days. How, how long does it take to do? Painting? Or was it research? The question comes up and disappears really quick, so. I'm, uh, I'm seeing I'm seeing different questions on my end um, versus the ones you're seeing privately, Gil. Okay. We do have a couple more here. Um, uh, yeah, type, them, asked, type them into the main room, not to me, because I'm not I'm not open to that right now. Craig Williams asks, "What got you into painting?" Uh, I was taking architect classes at the university that I was going at the U of U. And I was taking physics and math classes, and I thought I need I need a break. And I had always wanted to learn how to uh, oil paint, and I'd never oil painted before. And so I thought I'd take an oil painting class, and um, I found out that it wasn't as hard as I thought it was, and I really enjoyed working in oil. And I had played dabbled in watercolor before. I mean, I hadn't really done any other work in a, a traditional watercolor or oil before I went to college. I mean, I'd sketch a lot, but that was about it. So, um, yeah, from then, it was from then, uh, about 1980, I think it was 83, and I f sold my first painting in, in 1984. And I would sell my paintings to go to put myself through school. So I'd, I'd do a, a painting for a class, and then I'd say, will you grade it? Because um, I think this one's sold. And so they would grade it, and then I would go sell the painting. So I'm good money. <laughs> go that way. It was kind of fun. Mark Faust asks if you ever hide any Easter eggs in your paintings, uh, something like the uh, mouse in every Terrence Cuneo that people would only notice if they look closely. Uh, there are times when I will put like animal tracks in the paintings or in the snow, but I usually do not hide any names. Uh, sometimes there will be some whimsy. I know uh, in one of the paintings Howard Fogg did for the Miner Company, there was he did a painting in Florida of the Florida East Coast. There was a man in a canoe or in a in a little flat boat, and there was an alligator, and he put an arm in the alligator's mouth, and they were not very excited about that. So he had to paint the bloody arm that was in the alligator's mouth out in that painting. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, there's there's been a couple that I, I will add a little a couple of things to, but it's not. I mean, mainly I'm trying to get these things off the cam or off the easel as fast as possible, so I don't have time to actually add a little teeny tiny funny things in there very often. Well, that actually leads to another question from Craig Williams, who asks, uh, if you make a mistake, uh, how do you fix it? In oil, it's like painting uh, your your house wall. I mean, you can just cover it up with oil. In watercolor, you got to throw it out and start over. So um, I actually have a pile of dead watercolors on my computer floor that I, and as I get better, I've been able to resurrect one or two of them, but there's a lot that are just kind of thrown away that are in the trash. What about when one of your sons helps you with a watercolor? Um, I had, yeah, when I was doing a painting for a book cover, I just finished it, and uh, my son came in with a pencil and scribbled all over the sky. And so um, that was the first day I mixed uh, watercolor with airbrush to see if I could wipe out the pencil. And that actually worked. <laughs> but I, I like, my sons are older now, so my my you know two and three year olds are not scribbling not scribbling on my paintings anymore. Chris Berger asks about a copyright, and so when when you sell something to a client, do you retain the copyright, or does that go with your work to the client? No, the copy the copyright always stays with the creator. Uh, I can 
tell them, yeah, you can publish this or whatever. And and at times they will send me money for the copyright. But as far as the creator of the painting, the copyright always stays with me. Um, that was a, I had a copyright lawyer uh, come up to me and talk to me about this whole thing. So if on my name, there's a little logo in front of the B and it's actually a theta. I was in physics. I, playing around with some of the theta signs. And so that's what that is. It's a theta in front of the thing, in front of my name. And that's the, that's my copyright thing. So what, um, what are you working on next? Uh, right now I have a veranda gas turbine on the, uh, on the easel. And it, this one's in the, in the depths of Weber Canyon. Um, if I had the if I had a webcam I could show it to you it's not that far along but that's what I'm working on now and and after that is a E8 it's the Portland Rose in Boise Idaho and after that it's Wisconsin Central F45s somewhere and then after that it's the CNO Allegheny and then there's a Little Joe and that's as far as I can. Oh, no. No, before that, I have, sorry, Bon. Uh, <laughs> I have a painting for Bon of Park City that I've, that's in there somewhere that I've got to do the sketch for and send him. So <clears throat> that's, that's the lineup for the next few months anyway. Sounds spectacular. We look forward to an update. <laughs>